Hey everyone, I'm Ted Killington. Welcome to Justice Trek. Uh, this is episode 17, where I will be talking about 1960's The Brave and the Bold, number 29. I am here right now from the Capital City Comic Con in beautiful downtown Lansing, Michigan. Thanks for paying attention. Now it's kind of crowded here, so I'm going to record the rest of the show at home. Welcome to Justice Trek. My name is Ted Kilvington, and this is an audio and video log that journeys through comic book history as I discuss individual comic book stories of Star Trek, the Justice Society, and the world's greatest superheroes, the Justice League of America. Justice Trek is the only show devoted to the entirety of these great comic book series. From the 1940 debut of the JSA, the launch of the JLA and Star Trek comic books in the 1960s, and right up to comics hot off today's shelves, this show will impact you in 5, 4, 3, 2, 1... Hello! I had a great time at the Capital City Comic Con this afternoon, and now I'm going to have a great time talking with you. Uh, with me, as always, is my cat, Neo. Uh, she is jealous of you because she thinks the time I pay attention to you, I should be paying attention to her. She gets plenty of attention, folks. Don't worry. She does not let me uh, go all day without giving her something. Uh, I've got many previous episodes available for your viewing pleasure, such as episode 15, where I discussed 2022's The New Golden Age Number 1, the first full Justice Society story in over 10 years. In episode 16, where I talked about 2022's Star Trek Klingons from IDW. Uh, so today's episode, as I'm going to cover, as I mentioned in the intro from Capital City Comic Con, Two, or 1960s, The Brave and the Bold, number 29, the second ever appearance of the Justice League of America. My reference copy. Is Justice League of America Archives, Volume 1. Uh, I first read this story uh, when I got Volume 1, which was sometime in the 90s. Uh, and um, read it again when I was covering my, um, uh, my, my my podcast that I was doing from 2016 through 2019. And I read it again for the show. So if you like what I'm doing, please click like, please click subscribe. Well, let's get on with it. Uh, now, the Justice League has had one previous appearance before this story. And of course, uh, I covered that in episode five. Uh, which was 1959's The Brave and the Bold, number 28. Um, in that issue, the JLA had already formed, um, but uh, uh, we did see the very first appearances of both uh, Starro the Conqueror and Snapper Carr. Snapper helped the Justice League defeat Starro, and in gratitude, they made uh, Snapper an honorary member. Uh, brief roll call. We've got uh, Wonder Woman, who is Princess Diana, a.k.a. U.S. Air Force Lieutenant Diana Prince. Uh, Batman, Bruce Wayne. Snapper, Lucas Carr. Flash, Barry Allen. The Manhunter from Mars, Jean Jones, a.k.a. Police Detective John Jones. Aquaman, Arthur Curry. Green Lantern, Hal Jordan. And finally, Superman, Kal-El, a.k.a. Clark Kent. The Brave and the Bold, number 29, was published March 1st, 1960, with a 10-cent cover price and a May cover date. Challenge of the Weapons Master was a 26-page story by Gardner Fox writer, Mike Sikowski pencil artist, Bernard Sachs ink artist, uh, only chapters 1, 3, and 5, Joe Giella ink artist, chapters 2 and 4, Gaspar Saladino letterer, and Julius Schwartz editor. Okay, now I've got to do my announcer voice. The name and fame of the Justice League of America have spread not only to every corner of the earth, but throughout the ages. Yes, 
Even in the far distant future, the 20th century heroes are regarded as the greatest, mightiest fight crime-fighting team that ever existed. Now, from out of the uncharted, unknown years, appears a future man to engage the Super 7 members in combat. A battle that history will record as a defeat for the Justice League. Challenge of the Weapons Master. Uh, the story opens in the year 11,000... 960, which of course is exactly 10,000 years in the future of uh, the time the story was published. Uh, we see our villain, Xotar, the, uh, in the cavern he uses as a weapons cache, uh, standing next to a giant robot. Uh, just outside the uh, sealed thick metal door to the cavern are the intersolar police, who are using a heating device to melt through the door. Xotar climbs onto a lifting device, which raises him to the necessary height to the entrance to his robot's control chamber, as he thinks to himself that he has four weapons uh, to use to fight the police, and they have counter weapons to three of them. Uh, this leaves one weapon, which will defeat the police, uh, but he doesn't know which one. Just as the police enter the chamber, he mentions that the robot is also a time machine. So he will travel 10,000 years into the past to test the four weapons against the Justice League. He deduces that whichever of the four weapons cannot be defeated by the Justice League must be the weapon that also cannot be defeated by the Intersolar Police. Uh, Sotar is certain of his plan as he located an ancient book written by Wonder Woman. Uh, although large portions of the tech are uh, smudged to the point of illegibility, he is able to read something, 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 one of the four weapons used by Xotar, something, something, to defeat the Justice League of America. Xotar then recounts how he discovered the weapons. He mentions the uh, microscopator, uh, without saying how he acquired it, but then he says he stole his de-evolutionizer uh, from the Interstellar Science Laboratory. He found his third weapon in the ancient ruins of a dead Andromedan world, uh, and then found the fourth weapon, which was made for the mad director of Aldebaran, floating deep in space. He then explains that his robot's name is Ilaric, and that he was the master robot of the robot planet Illyrium. Sotar was able to seize control of the robot by, putting, by, or by cutting the control wires from its neutronic brain. Arriving in 1960, Xotar encounters Snapper Carr, who is ice skating. He then commands Ilaric to grab Snapper and takes him back to the Justice League's cavern headquarters. En route, Snapper is able to activate the JLA alarm belt, which the Justice League previously gave him when they made him an honorary member. Responding to the summons, uh, Flash, Wonder Woman, the Manhunter from Mars, Aquaman, Batman, and Green Lantern race to their hidden sanctuary as the reader is asked the question, Of all the Justice League members, only Superman fails to respond to the alarm. Why? Once the heroes arrive, they see Snapper seated at the meeting table as he speaks in a voice not his own. I, Xotar, on the year 11,960, have borrowed your young friend in order to summon you here and challenge you to combat. You shall fight me one at a time to help me determine which weapon will overcome the intersolar police. First, I select Flash! As the Martian Manhunter suggests that they should all go after Xotar at the same time, Ilaric shines a yellow light beam that he calls a gravitic ray on the assembled members, which renders the heroes immobile. Xotar thinks to himself that the gravitic ray is not itself a weapon because it not only immobilizes, it also protects its subjects from other harm. Knowing that the Flash can free himself, Xotar issues the following challenge. And the ghost walks at Hesperus on the second day of the moonless month. I am waiting to do battle. 
As chapter two opens up, Flash races through the town of Middledale as he muses to himself that the phrase, when the ghost walks, is a theatrical slang for payday. Uh, but he needs to find a library to find a clue to the word Hesperus. At super speed, Flash uses the books in the library to learn that Hesperus is the name given by the ancient poet Homer uh, in his Iliad to the planet Venus. Deducing that the reference to Venus means that Xotar will strike at a Florida missile base that is preparing to launch a rocket to the planet Venus. Uh, the Scarlet Speedster races to the Sunshine State, realizing that the moonless month means February, which at 28 days is too short for a full lunar cycle. Arriving at the missile base and uh, briefing the local officials, Flash then races to challenge Xotar and Ilaric, who have arrived and started destroying the Venus rocket. As Flash is struck with a ray from the microscopator, the Scarlet Speedster shrinks to six inches tall. He does still have his powers, though, and so he tunnels underground at super speed and then vibrates his way through Ilaric itself up to the control chamber, where he then generates enough friction heat to melt the microscopator. Ejecting both Tiny Flash and the now useless weapon, Xotar then immediately flees through the time stream back to JLA headquarters to return to the same moment he left. Now, in Chapter 3, Xotar frees Aquaman and the Martian Manhunter with the challenge, I will strike where the sun rises in the west and sets in the east. Deducing that the future man is referring to the part of the Isthmus of Panama, where the landmass twists in such a way that the Atlantic, or eastern coast, is actually on the western shore, while the Pacific, or western coast, is actually on the eastern shore, our heroes race to the canal, where Xotar immediately uses his de-evolutionizer on Jean Jones, which blasts him into nothingness. Aquaman, on the other hand, has commanded a mass of giant octopi to drag Elaric into the ocean, musing that he is actually a diversion, as the Manhunter has used his Martian powers to turn invisible uh, to make Xotar think he was defeated. Jean then uses his powers to fashion a mirror out of the sand on the beach, then flies towards Elaric, just as Xotar then shoots the de-evolutionizer again. However, the beam reflects off of uh, Jean's mirror, returning back to Ilaric and destroying the weapon. So Xotar again flees back to JLA headquarters. In Chapter 4, Xotar then frees Wonder Woman, Batman, and Green Lantern and challenge them, challenges them to fight him above the living stone of the ring-necked pheasant. As Batman races off to locate Superman, Wonder Woman and Green Lantern deduce that the riddle refers to South Dakota, which has the ring-necked pheasant as its state bird, and specifically to the presidential faces carved in Mount Rushmore, the Stone Giants. As they arrive, Xotar fires his magneto-bubble weapon at Wonder Woman, uh, which surrounds the amazing Amazon in her robot plane as it sends them through space to a distant sun, which will destroy both woman and plane. However, Green Lantern uses his power ring to create a meteor which collides with the bubble in such a way to destroy it, freeing Wonder Woman and her jet. Green Lantern then flees towards, uh, Green Lantern then flies toward Ilaric uh, as Wonder Woman lassos the barrel of the magneto bottle, uh, jamming the barrel with the uh, clay found nearby. Defeated again, Xotar takes off as he muses that the fourth device must be the undefeatable weapon. In Chapter 5, the heroes, minus Batman, uh, reunite at their sanctuary as Xotar again speaks through Snapper to challenge the heroes to battle him in the Valley of the Ten Thousand Smokes. Racing to the Alaskan Valley in question, named such because of the natural volcanic fumaroles, the heroes are then transported by the fourth weapon to a distant planet where they are attacked by a horde of alien monsters. 
The League members are unable to defeat the alien creatures, although Xotar ruminates that the fourth weapon is actually an illusion maker, which will trick the heroes into destroying each other. His plan appears to be working until Batman shows up with Superman. Revealing that Superman didn't answer Snapper's summons because he had uh, been traveling through time, although Batman was somehow able to track him down through time. And then the Man of Steel promptly thrashes Ilaric and destroys the Illusion Maker. Superman then locks the time controls to Ilaric and sends Sotar back to his cavern in the year 11,960 AD, where he is promptly captured by the Inter-Solar Police. Xotar can't believe that his book misled him, although back in 1960, Wonder Woman writes down the adventure it is re um, and it is revealed that what she actually wrote says, the illusion maker was one of the four weapons used by Xotar in his unsuccessful attempt to defeat the Justice League of America. So earlier I said, used by Xotar in his something something attempt, well, the, the something something was unsuccessful. Uh, this concludes the second ever Justice League story. Okay, um, thanks for being here. I uh, hope you like what you're uh, experiencing. If you do, please click like, please click subscribe. Now I'm going to take a quick break. Uh, I'm going to play the credits. And then afterwards, uh, in about uh, seven, 90 seconds, uh, I'll return with uh, my analysis of the story I just read, uh, as well as uh, I'll tell you what I picked up at the Capital City Comic Con today. So stick around. It'll be good. If you have questions or comments, please feel free to send them to me on Twitter under the handle at Justice Trek or via email at thejusticetrek at gmail.com. Be sure to include the word the at the beginning of the email address. For research purposes, I rely heavily on dc.fandom.com, memory-alpha.fandom.com, comicvine.gamespot.com, the Grand Comics Database at comics.org, and Mike Boyle's website, Mike's Amazing World of DC Comics at dcindexes.com. The opinions expressed are solely those of the host and any participants. This podcast is not a commercial enterprise and does not make any money. All copyrights are held by their respective owners. The opening sequence was animated by Craig Smith of Phoenix Studios. The opening music is Dragon Slayer by the Mackay Symphony. All music used is either public domain and or not protected by copyright. Under Section 107 of the Copyright Act of 1976, allowance is made for fair use for purposes such as criticism, comments, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. Fair use is a use permitted by copyright statute that might otherwise be infringing. Nonprofit, educational, or personal use tips the balance in favor of fair use. Hey, welcome back. Thanks for being here. I know you have an infinite number of things you can be doing with your time, and I appreciate you spending a fraction of that here with me. So, um, at the comic at the Capital City Comic Con uh, today, um, I from three different vendors, I received the following comics. Uh, a lot of them are just I mean, looking for little things to fill in certain gaps in my collection. Uh, as you may be able to tell from the uh, dozens and dozens of uh, short boxes, and I've got uh, dozens of long boxes as well, um, I have a lot of comics, and I get it mostly at discount prices. You know, I won't tell you exactly how much money I make, but I will say it's my I've never grossed. Uh, more than five figures, never, let alone net, never even grossed that much. So uh, I acquire most of these through bargain bins. So um, I have a next number three, uh, Batman three jokers. Number two, I had previously ordered one, two and three through the mail, uh, got one and three. And they said, oops, couldn't, didn't have number two. 
then they refunded the money, of course, but I wouldn't have even bought uh, one and three if um, it didn't, they didn't say that they were going to give me the set. But finally, I got the set. Uh, Beast Boy number three and number four. This is from the uh, 19, or not 19, uh, 99, uh, the 2000 miniseries. Well, actually, it started in 1999. Um, and uh, I already had the first two issues. Now I have the second two, and I can read that. From 1964, Blackhawk number 199. Uh, you may recall that in episode seven and eight, I uh, talked a lot about the Blackhawks, and I'm a big Blackhawk fan. I've got all the Blackhawks published uh, since 1966, but prior to that, I definitely have some gaps in my collection. Uh, Captain America, Volume 3, Number 48. Captain America, Volume 4, Number 25. Captain America, Volume 4, Number 28. Uh, uh, Captain Marvel... I'm not sure which volume this is. It's the first Peter David run. So Captain Marvel, first Peter David run, number 17. Uh, they restarted that so many times. Like, if they do a one-shot, does that count as a whole volume? Uh, or miniseries, does that count as a whole volume? Um, if you go, go by just the number of Captain Marvel number ones, um, I think it's number five. I think it's the fifth Captain Marvel number one at that point. Uh, and that's not that's only including the Marvel comics, because I think the Fawcett uh, Captain Marvel uh, was actually titled Captain Marvel Adventures. Uh, next, I have Detective Comics number 608, the first appearance of Anarchy. Five bucks. Another dealer had the same uh, comic in the same condition at the convention. They were asking three times the price. It pays to bargain hunt. I've got the Incredible Hercules, number 135. Uh, the Incredible Hulk, first series, number 448 and 463. Uh, again, uh, two Peter David issues. Uh, now, I, while I have said before that I have all the main universe Justice League stories, I was, I'm missing some of the animated universe stories. Uh, as well as some of the Elseworld stories. Well, I picked up a couple of those today. Uh, JLA Age of Wonder, number one and number two. Uh, JLA The Secret Society of Superheroes, number one and number two. Uh, from the very um, New Warriors, volume one, number 73. DC Tarzan, number 230, a 100-page super spectacular Five bucks. Uh, ten, uh, Tempest Fugitive, number three. And number four. Uh, Thor, uh, volume two, number 83. Thunderbolts, uh, volume one, number 99. Number 102. Number 125. Number 136. Thunderbolts, Volume 2, Number 4, Number 6, Thunderbolts, Volume 3, Number 10, and X-Factor, Volume 1, Number 23, just a buck. Okay, those were the uh, comics I got at the convention. Um, none of them cost more than... Uh, well, actually, even the one I said cost five bucks, um, they're actually having a special. If you buy um, four $5 comics, they would give you a fifth one. So when you average it out, it was really only four bucks. I never paid more than four bucks for any of those. Now, I also today received my uh, mail order shipment of new comics. Now, as I mentioned before, I mostly buy my uh, new comics through the mail. And, uh, you know, there are... Uh, the, the nearest comic shop uh, that sells new comics to where I live is 10 miles away. And uh, I rarely get uh, that down there. Um, I can mean, count on my fingers the number of times a year I, I get into an actual comic shop these days. But the comics that I had delivered today 
Uh, no, it was actually um, five weeks uh, in this month. But um, so I got uh, now this is all new stuff. So it'll be whatever the current volume is. So I got The Amazing Spider Man, number 26. Avengers Beyond, number three. Power Girl Special, number one. Star Trek Annual 2023. Warlock Rebirth, number two. Adventures of Superman, John Kent, number four. Uh, Fantastic Four, number eight. Shazam, number two. Spider-Man, number eight. Oh, nine. Excuse me. Spider-Man, number nine. Star Trek Defiant, number four. Steelworks, number one. The Amazing Spider-Man, number 27. Green Lantern, number two. Multiversity, Harley Screws Up, the DCU, number four. Spirit World, number two. Star Trek, number nine. Superman Lost, number four. Wolverine, number 34. Avengers, number two. Batman and Superman, World's Finest, number 16. Black Adam, number 12. Bloodline, Daughter of Blade, number 5. Scarlet Witch, annual number 1. Superboy, The Man of Tomorrow, number 3. Superman, number 5. Titans, number 2. Ultimate Invasion, number one. Action Comics, number 1056. The Amazing Spider-Man, number 28. Avengers Beyond, number four. Batman, The Brave and the Bold, number two. Green Arrow, number three. Time Before Time, number four. Or, excuse me, Time Before Time, number 24. Warlock Rebirth, number three. Junkyard Joe, volume one, trade paperback. Once Upon a Time at the End of the World, trade paperback, volume one. Star Trek, The Mirror War, trade paperback. Star Trek, Warriors of the Mirror War, trade paperback. And last but not least, Star Trek, Picard, Stargazer, trade paperback. Okay, now my challenge is to read all of these in less than a month. I've got my work cut out for me. It's a tough job, but someone's got to do it. <laughs> Getting back to The Brave and the Bold, number 29. The cover art to this issue uh, was uh, penciled by Mike Sikowski and inked by Murphy Anderson. Now, while the previous issue's cover was... Uh, I, I, I read something online that said it was inspired by a Japanese movie poster which I, I didn't think it was that much of a resemblance. I mean, yeah, it was, they were both giant monsters, um, but uh, it was like, oh, okay, yeah, here, different heroes fighting a giant monster. That's, I don't know, it, that seems like a kind of generic concept by 1959. Um, but this month's issue, number 29, was definitely inspired by the cover to All-Star Comics number 43. That issue had an October-November 1948 cover date, and both pencil and ink art on the original version was by Erwin Hazen. The image was of a giant robot with a, a belly control chamber. Uh, so it's a humanoid robot, except in where the, the, the belly would be is a, a con control chamber. So obviously it's uh, a li that, you know several times the size of a normal human. Um... 
but in that version, they had three people in the control chamber, whereas in um, Xotar's robot, Alaric, there was only enough room for him in the control chamber. Um, and, of course, around on the uh, cover to All-Star, the, um, that issue had uh, JSA members um, uh, Hawkman, Black Canary, Flash, Adam, Wonder Woman, Dr. Midnight, and Green Lantern. Uh, now, a lot of DC editors, including Justice League editor Julia Schwartz, uh, were often inspired by previous cover images, and they would often use those as a recurring device. Uh, one of the uh, thought processes of comic editors at the time is that comics were for kids and that kids had only read comics in, within a range of about five years. So they would kind of write comics geared for 10-year-olds, so maybe 7 through 12-year-olds would read them. And after five years, then who, all the readers would have aged out and it was okay to reuse concepts, uh, whether it's story concepts or, or, or art concepts, because the uh, original readers would have already uh, stopped reading comics by then. Um, it, while uh, obviously not everyone did, I mean, there were a lot of comic fans in the adult comic fans in the 50s and 60s who read comics continuously. Uh, it probably was true for a large portion of the comic buying audience in 1960. Now, in my opinion, this story is classic Fox. Sikowski and Schwartz uh, at their best. Fox and Schwartz had deep science fiction roots, uh, perhaps more so than any other writer and editor in the history of comics. And that is no overstatement. Uh, when a story begins with a fugitive from the intersolar police from 10,000 years in the future, you know that it's not just another superhero bash em up story. And just look at the face on the man-child Sotar. Sikowski's style was his own, and he excelled at the non-superhero portions of the story. Now, to be sure, there were some things I didn't like about the story, besides uh, Gardner Fox's typical lack of characterization. Um, for example, uh, the script had too many examples of telling what happened instead of showing what happened. Uh, for example, on the top of page four, Sotar spends three panels just sitting in his uh, robot control chamber, uh, thinking about how he acquired a couple of his weapons when artist Mike Sikowski could just have drawn the acquisitions. Show, don't tell. And there were also several huge holes in Sotar's logic. Uh, the first problem with Sotar's plan was his assumption that the missing portions of the 10,000-year-old book didn't reveal that there were some complications in his plan. Then he assumed that just because a weapon might defeat the Justice League, that the advanced technological resources of the Intersolar Police would also be able to overcome, or, or would also be unable to overcome defeat. Um, there were also his puzzles. Now, while it's a clever story gimmick for writer Gardner Fox, uh, challenging the heroes to solve a puzzle wouldn't be of any help to Xotar in defeating them. And defeating a Justice League comprised of characters like Aquaman and Batman is not the same as defeating Superman. Superman, of course, served as another weak point in the story. Uh, being a literal deus ex machina, you know, god in the machine, you know, the literally, oh no, how do we defeat this giant robot? Oh, look, Superman appears and defeats the giant, you know, machine. And how exactly was Batman able to contact a time traveling Superman? Now, just because over 50 years of hindsight can pinpoint a, uh, well, gosh, over 60 years of hindsight now, um, can pinpoint a few flaws in the script. Overall, Fox's story was an enjoyable one. Um, the puzzles, while of no use to Xotar, were a clever riddle for the readers. Uh, we got to see more of Batman in this issue than we did in the previous issue. And we get to see not one, but two pairs of superhero action. Especially since both pairs, Aquaman and Jean Jones and Wonder Woman and Green Lantern, were different from the one pair in the previous story, which was Jean Jones and Wonder Woman. 
And while Snapper was no help, of course, in defeating the villain, at least he got to do something besides yard work. Uh, the futuristic menace and giant robot were also nice touches, echoing the work Fox and Schwartz had been doing on science fiction comic styles, um, or comic stories such as Strange Adventures and Mystery in Space. Uh, ultimately, though, Sotar would prove to be a one-time villain. The only threat from the JLA's first year never to appear again. Now, in, uh, when Dan Jurgens began his run on Justice League in 1992, he did have a character called the Weapons Master, but if memory serves me, that character was not called Sotar. It was just a different dude. In fact, that was a dude who was a rather buff, good-looking fellow, not the uh, scrawny weirdo we see here. Um, so, yeah, same name, um, same MO even. Different character. Now, when the gravitic beam and magneto bubble were interesting weapons, uh, there wasn't much to the character besides the interesting visual of being in the belly of a giant robot. And as mentioned earlier, even that bit was taken from a comic that came out 12 years earlier. And of course, is it a coincidence that the only one of the first five villains of the JLA's first year of publishing that never appeared again was also the only one whose name did not end in the letter O? Uh, they did a great uh, story once where it was, they talked about how so many of the classic DC villains had a name that ended in the letter O. So, uh, Starro, we had in the first story. Next issue, we'll have Amazo, then Despero, um, Kanjaro, um, and uh, uh, that's just in, in the first year of Justice League. Plus, there's other characters like Titano, Bizarro. Um, they did a story once where uh, the, the, they called it the O Squad, where a group of villains are teaming up. One of the villains was T. Omaro. And then um, the villains turned on him when they realized that uh, his name, Maro, was actually spelled with a W on the end, like the word tomorrow. So T.O. Maro did not end in the O, so he was kicked out of the O squad. Wah, wah. I always thought, though, if I were ever given a chance to write the JLA, I would be the guy to bring Xotar back. For no other reason than that no one else seemed interested in doing so. Um, now, Sikowski's drawing of the only part of Sotar's body we saw, his face, also shifted a lot in this issue. Sometimes he would look old, sometimes young, and sometimes like an idiot man-child. I mean, who wants to um, uh, and get their entertainment from an idiot man-child? Don't! The, the, the script did not indicate a personality for the villain, so it's unknown whether the artistic decision uh, to draw, uh, shift the, the, the way Sikowski drew Sotar, if that was Sikowski's decision or uh, Gardner Fox's or even editor Schwartz. Uh, and Sikowski also used artistic license to change the size of Alaric. As sometimes the robot appeared two stories tall, and other times he appeared three or even four stories tall. I didn't really notice any stylistic differences in the inking in this story, uh, as both Bernard Sachs and Joe Giella seemed to make effective use of the blacks while allowing Sikowski's drawing sense to shine through. Murphy Anderson's use of black on the space scene on page three was especially striking, as was Joe Giello's delineation of the president's faces carved into Mount Rushmore on page 18. Ultimately, I guess what I liked about this story was how emblematic it was of the series. Science fiction menaces, a perfect segue from strange adventures type yarns to the more traditional superheroics that were um, uh, reasserting their control over the comic book medium at that time, uh, teamwork between the world's greatest superheroes, uh, storytelling that placed story and action over images and dialogue, and a script that tied it all together. Now, I haven't done feedback in a while, so let's get into it. Uh, on Twitter, Ed Moore of Teal Productions, uh, and he does 
the Lords of Order uh, podcast, I think that's the name of it, um, he retweeted the announcement tweets for episodes 10, 11, 12, and 15. Ross Aitken of the Stop, Let's Team Up podcast also retweeted the announcement tweets for episodes 11 and 13, and he also appeared on those episodes. Over on YouTube, we are now up to 65 subscribers. For episode 9.1, the user Ocelot, who came to T, 9173, commented, uh, I was thinking of doing a voice, but it's like, what, what does an ocelot sound like? Uh, let's see, how would I do a British voice with a lisp? Uh, I remember buying this in 1978. It's really held together well, and set in art is excellent. For episode 9.2, Ocelot commented, I think you mean Green Arrow, not Green Lantern. A reference to a misspoken a line of mine. Um, and Ocelot, I'm, I'm just... <laughs> and Mr. Ocelot, whoever you are, I'm just trying to have some fun. I, I don't think you really talk like that. Um, just trying to uh, the, create a, a vocal characterization of the name Ocelot who came to tea. Um, let's see. Now... Uh, on episode 9.2, we also had a comment from Dragon King 3800. Uh, he commented, another great video, sir. Keep them coming. On episode 11, the user Prakash on Basics 3670 commented, as a kid, I was a DC fan. In India, comics were not as common as in the US. On the same episode, Dragon King commented, loved the back and forth. Also a huge fan of Young Justice. Red Tornado is a very underrated character, one of my favorites because of Young Justice. On episode 13, a user named Rick KF8FN commented, I never saw that one, but I loved the Justice League. My favorite JLA comic was a 100-page Super Spectacular. It was from 1974. I was six, and I loved it. On the cover, under the title, it said, Here come TV Super Friends! I like that because that meant that the JLA was, and are, the Super Friends. I love your show. Thanks for the content. Uh, he continued, I really enjoy you and your friend talking about Gardner Fox, and I totally agree about Dick Dillon. I really loved his work. Uh, I had no idea Jerry Conway was script editor for Law & Order. Makes sense. Thanks for a real fun show. And on episode 15, Rick commented, I'm with you. Uh, this is right. He's referring to a scene where um, uh, Per Dagaton murdered the Dr. Fate of the 31st century. And uh, Rick said, I'm with you. I don't need to see someone's neck get snapped. They could have just had a caption saying it happened. Um, one thing they do a lot in Hollywood, um, or you know, film and television, is uh, a cutaway. So you may like see the face of the killer and the face of the victim, and then you cut away to uh, the face of a witness, and then you, when you go back to the killer and victim, you see the victim's body slump over. So you don't actually see the moment of murder. That's how they can do some uh, uh, seemingly brutal things like you know, snap a neck or uh, stab someone or shoot someone, whatever, uh, without actually showing it. Um, they could have done something similar here. Yes, obviously you are capable of showing, uh, you can draw anything, but doesn't mean that's the most effective way to tell it. Just remember, I have many previous episodes available for your viewing pleasure, uh, such as episode five, where I covered the first appearances of the Justice League, Snapper, and Starro from 1959's The Brave and the Bold, number 28. We have episode 15, where I covered 2022's The New Golden Age, number 1, featuring the Justice Society of America. In episode 16, where I talked about 2022's Star Trek Klingons from IDW. Please join me for my next episode, where I will discuss 1980's Star Trek, number 6, from Marvel Comics. 
Uh, now that's a, a good one, folks. It was uh, by Mike W. Barr, and it is a murder mystery. Uh, and also join me for the following episode, please, where I will get into 1978's Justice League of America number 161, the issue where Zatanna joins the team. Thank you very much for sticking around to the hopefully not better end. Hopefully it's a sweet end. <laughs> please click like, please click subscribe, and hey, keep on Justice Trekking. Hello, everyone. Um, I had a great time at the Capital City Comic Con, and now I'm here to talk about The Brave and the Bold, number 29. With me, as always, is my kitten, Neo. Uh, as I've said many a time, and I'm probably will have to say many a time again, she gets jealous of the attention I pay to you, that she thinks I should be paying attention to her and her alone. Well, I have a wife, I have three other cats, well, she may want all my attention, but she doesn't get it. Plus that pesky thing of, you know, having a day job to pay the bills. Mm. So, uh...